She has the reputation for being the country's fiercest television and cinema critic, but if you read her autobiography, you'll also discover that she's one of the finest raconteurs. So let's hope today she regales us with stories from her fascinating life as I introduce you to the legendary Amita Malik. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Judging by your autobiography, some of the most amazing things have happened to you. Would you say in your case, truth has been often stranger than fiction? Perhaps, yes. To begin with, you were born into perhaps one of the most aristocratic families in Bengal. I gather at one point in time, you owned what is today's Calcutta and the famous Kali Ghat Temple. That's right. We were the Shavanna Chaudhrys. And sold it, I believe, in 1698 for a pittance. I'm afraid so. Almost 13 pieces of silver to 1300 rupees. How did you find out all this? Was it your nephew who kept a history who told you? That's right. He's done the history of Calcutta, a book on Calcutta. But there is a history of the Shabana Chaudhary family too, written by my grandfather. And this obviously is a great source of family pride, that once upon a time Calcutta was yours. Yes, but we are all also ashamed of having sold it to the British. <laughs> the two go together, don't they? Now your own life began with an unexpected encounter with Mahatma Gandhi. And yes, I was about 21 days old and uh, my father had bought his first car and wanted to take me for a drive. So both my grandmother and mother were absolutely against it. They thought it would jolt my bones all over the place. But uh, father won the day because my aunt had made a little pink frock for me and she said, my new niece must go out for a drive in this. So she sat in front with daddy and I sat at the back on my grandmother's lap and my mother. And as we came out of the gate, there was a mild collision with another car and in the car was Mahatma Gandhi my first encounter with greatness. So he was very concerned when he was told there was a newborn infant in the car and he heard that I was all right, gave me his blessings and the car moved on. Amazing, blessed by an accident. <coughs> you grew up in Guwahati and Shillong in the 1930s in what was very much British India. What sort of childhood was it? Well, it was a mixed thing. And on the one hand, there was discipline, but there was lots of fun, you know. We did what forbidden now we went for shika we went for drives we went for treks in the forest and uh, we had lovely food with five servants in the house including two khansamas and we had uh, english dinners from soup to nuts and all the same with all that sport and a house with a large compound it it was something it was um, very different from the city life I'm used to now. And whenever I go back to Guwahati, it takes me back to those days. It, was, it seems to have been full of all sorts of interesting, amazing things. For instance, you had a cow called Moongli who once got terribly drunk. Yes, the Dhobi who used to stand in the Brahmaputra to wash the clothes used to get very cold by the evening. So he bought a large vat full of toddy, tari. And this cow somehow got onto it and finished about a quarter of the vat. So when um, the Dhobi came home, he was very, very angry. And the only bonus we got from it was, because the cow was so drunk, we said to mother, we can't possibly drink her milk because it's <laughs> got tari in it. So we were let off the hated cup of milk for a few days. Yes, it wasn't milk that you were so fond of. As I read in your autobiography, you say of yourself and your siblings that you were natural tomboys in that hidey, sporty atmosphere. Tennis was the favorite That's game. That's right. Family game. Your father bought you a very special pair of divided skirts from Hall and Anderson. That's right. Where did you dig all this up? <laughs> oh, my autobiography. <laughs> so, yes, so, and I played tennis with the boys in Cotton College. It was a fairly conservative college in those days. So, father said, if you're going to play tennis, you can't flounder in a sari. So, he ordered these by mail. And I played tennis with the boys. But it wasn't just tennis. You were a very accomplished pianist. And am I right in saying that it was a performance of Liszt's Hungarian Rhapsody that got you invited to tea with the governor's wife. That's right. There were four of us. It was for eight hands and uh, two pianos. And I was the only girl in a sari. The rest were all the Smiths and the Joneses and all that. So she noticed this, and I was asked to tea at government house the next day. And I was collected in a yellow Rolls Royce. A bit like the song. <laughs> That's right. And then I was treated to scones and Genoa cake. And then the governor's wife, who was a very lively lady, she climbed on a sofa and asked me if I'd read Kipling. And she just uh, brought down the book. And, and how old were you when all of this happened? I was 13. So were you intimidated or were you excited? Very excited. 
and then she took me to the club and I had to dance with the Maharaja. And it had the whole... Never danced before. And never with the mm. Maharaja? No. <laughs> <laughs> it must have had the whole of Guwahati and Sri Lanka society twittering with jealousy. Well, they were also proud. I mean, they were, they were lurking in the bushes to see if it was really true. And when the yellow Rolls Royce rolled up in style, they believed it. Sadly, not much later, when you were probably still in your teens, a very different sort of experience came your way. An attempted rape by your brother's cook in Calcutta. In you, Bombay. In Bombay. Bombay, yes. You write about it very matter-of-factly, but it must have been a traumatic horrible, experience. Horrible, horrible. The only saving grace was I was not quite conversant with all the facts of life then, but I knew something horrible had happened. He didn't get at me because I was then the tennis champ at school. So I kicked him off, locked him in the flat, uh, ran across the road to the police station. The sergeant there was my brother's friend. And he said, you sure you want to report this? And I said, yes. And my brother came home and did the classic thing. He beat up the servant and dislocated his own shoulder. Then after everyone in the hospital had made sure that nothing had happened, uh, there was a case. And the nicest thing was that when I had to give my testimony, the judge, the magistrate, he later became a high court judge, said to all the journalists present that she's a young girl and it might ruin, ruin her future if you report about this. So would you kindly not write about it? And at that, all the journalists to a man got up and left the room and never reported it. The interesting thing is that you write about it in your autobiography without any attempt to brush it under the carpet. Did it uh, take a lot of courage to actually write about it? Well, at that time it seemed a natural thing to do and I wrote about it now so much later in life because I thought it might lead other girls and their parents to see that justice is done and not just sweep it under the carpet. Now in 1940-41 when war broke out and the Japanese looked as if they were threatening Assam, your life in Guwahati ended. You moved to Lucknow and took up your first job with AIR. Mm -hmm. Do you remember it? Yes, I do. I got a hundred rupees a month. I had been auditioned in Calcutta during the war, but then we were not going to Calcutta. So that audition held good. So I presented myself at the radio station and they took me on on a hundred rupees a month and I had to do the English announcements in the evening and then I would also do a Saturday lunch hour program. There was only one Western music program and I quite often doubled as accompanist being a trained pianist. So it was fun. In fact, the station director at the time, who you've christened in your book, Lord Krishna, because of the way he attracted the girls, took quite a shine to you, didn't he? Uh, alas, he did. <laughs> he used to take you on his handle of his uh, handlebar of his bicycle, even tried to seduce you. Yes, but I put the basket between him and me. <laughs> <coughs> Were you in those days a very alluring, attractive person? Men seemed to have been falling head over heels in love with you wherever you went. Well, I don't know about that. But they did stand at the bottom of the stairs when I raced for my late evening announcements after a game of tennis in my short shorts. <laughs> Just to catch a glimpse. I suppose so. <coughs> you write of AIR where in fact your career blossomed and flowered in terms that make it so different to what it is today. What was it like in the 40s and 50s? It was absolutely wonderful because first of all we were I think selected on merit. There's a lot of uh, politics and nepotism nowadays in appointments. We were selected on merit. Most of us had done very well at the university. And many of us, many of them, later got into the IAS and other sort of more prized services. But while we were there, straight from the university, not only were we very creative and very eager to do something innovative, something challenging, but we were given full responsibility. I mean, a program assistant, as we were then called, could um, sort of record the prime minister with the station director only hovering in the wings. But we could say to Mr. Nehru, perhaps, sir, uh, you're talking a bit too fast. And nobody held it against us. Nobody would now dare to say to the Prime Minister, you're talking too fast. You did that once, didn't you? There was a very <laughs> eminent man and you ticked him off because his pronunciation was completely <laughs> wrong. Alas, yes, Dr. V. K. R. V. Rao. He was very generous about it. But was it, in fact, the sense of responsibility that every individual was given that made AIR different? Or was it that the people themselves who were there, were the brightest and the best? They were, and they were all professionals. They had all been in broadcasting, some had been in theatre. Uh, Professor Bokhari, who was the first Director General Indian, 
uh, was a um, student of literature and a first class broadcaster. When I was one day balancing a string quartet and he rang up on the hotline and said, Amita, I think the violin is too near the mic. So I said, Mr. Bukhari, I haven't balanced them yet. We are just timing it. He said, OK, carry on. But now I don't think a DG would have the time, even if he knew the difference, to ring up somebody who's recording a music recital and say the violin is too near the mic. The sad part is he might not even know the difference, even if he had the time. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Let's take a break. I want in part two to come back and talk about the incredible career that began at AIR and went on to win you the coveted BD Goenka Award. We'll be back in just a couple of moments. Stick with us. Welcome back. My guest is Amita Malik. Let's talk a little about some of the amazing interviews you've had. I believe you interviewed Pierre Trudeau when he was at the very height of his power and one of the most romantic prime ministers, but they practically made you do a change to the floorboards. Yes, they were very nervous. For the first time in my life when doing a TV interview, an engineer came up and said, we want to tie your sari to the chair. So I said, why? He said, well, it might touch the mic. I said, I always do it in a sari. I've done a lot of interviews. I've never touched the mic. Then I suddenly had an impish desire to embarrass them because they had embarrassed me. So I said, OK, tie my sari to the chair. So I would got to know Mr. Tudor because he was a very informal person. And I went on the trip to Benares and Agra with him. And he was very free and easy sitting in the common dining hall and all that and calling me Amita by then. So as soon as he came in, I said, I'm sorry, Prime Minister, I can't stand up for you because they've chained me to the chair. He said, have they? Let me unchain you. So he knelt on the floor and undid the <laughs> knot in the sari. So in addition to interviewing him, you had him on his <laughs> knees, literally. <laughs> Quite unintentionally. You're also one of the few people in this world to have actually managed to interview Inga Bergman on his set. That's right. And it all happened because of an accident with a coffee cup on a plane. That's right. I was flying from Copenhagen to Stockholm and sitting beside me was a very intense, pale-looking young man who didn't even say good morning, which is normal on a flight. As pale-looking young men sometimes don't. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so when the hostess brought around coffee, he spilled the hot cup of coffee onto my sari, and he had to say something then. So he said, I'm very, very sorry. He mopped it up, and then he said, what do you do? I said, I write on the cinema. And I said, what do you do? He said, I'm a film and stage actor. And my name is Per Oscarson, and he happened to be Ingmar Bergman's favorite actor. He'd done Hamlet on the stage for him and so on, and we've seen him in many films. So he was so ashamed that when we arrived at Stockholm, he went 40 kilometers out of the way to uh, drop me at my hotel. And then he invited me for the weekend to his lovely forest bungalow, as we call it in India, in the middle of one of those beautiful Swedish forests, which you see in Mark Bergman's films. By then, I had gone there for the second time to Sweden just to get Ingmar Bergman. And everybody failed, the Indian Embassy, the Foreign Office, uh, Swens Film Industry, everybody. So while we were having lunch at his uh, country cottage, Oskar soon said to me, is there anything you want to do in Sweden which you couldn't? I said, yes, interview Ingmar Bergman. He said, would you like to talk to him? I said, but of course. So. He said, uh, he went to the phone and said, uh, talk to Ingmar Bergman. As simply as that? Yes, because he was his favorite actor. So Ingmar Bergman said, and how are you, madam? I said, fine, thank you, Mr. Bergman. He said, I believe you want to see me. I said, yes. Well, what about tomorrow? <laughs> I said, yes, where? He said, at the studios. <coughs> oh, well, I nearly dropped down. But uh, I did go there, and uh, it was persona. And... Uh, the actress of Persona came out for the last International Film Festival, and she thought it was the sari that did it. <laughs> <laughs> she said, you were so tiny compared with us brutish, fleshy Swedes. <laughs> I don't know if it was the sari that did it or the coffee that got spilt on it, coffee. but I know many times it was your charm and sheer bravado, oh. because you barged into David Dean's bathroom virtually and made him give you an interview too. Well, it was my first interview with a foreign director. He was staying at the Imperial Hotel in Delhi. And I just went with, I think it was Raghu Rai was the cameraman probably. So I just turned up and knocked on his door because I'd been tipped off that he was in a particular room. And after I knocked, there was this handsome man, you know, the idol of all the film girls all over the world. And he said, yes. I said, well, Mr. Lean? He said, yes. I said, I want to interview you. He said, but I'm about to have a bath. 
So I said, uh, well, I'd still like to interview you. He said, what, in the bath? I said, no, 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 somewhere else. He said, all right, wait for me in the bar, which was a cruel thing to say to a young girl, you know, in those days, wait for me in the bar. And I'll come down in half an hour. I said, is that a promise? You won't not come, will you? said I, very ungrammatically. He said, no, no, I promise. And I got my interview. Amazing. In fact, not just this interview, looking at the string of interviews you've had, I have to actually look down to remind myself you've done Marlon Brando, Satyajit Ray, Kurosawa, Antonioni, Kazan. And the sad part is Durdashan has gone and lost most of those valuable they things. They have, they have. But you walked into the moonlight with Brando, didn't you? That's right. What did he say to you? <laughs> well, um, we had just finished dinner at the UK High Commissioners and you know they have a lovely garden with a very beautiful lawn. And the gardener had watered the lawn not wisely but too well. And I, in those days I wore stiletto heels. It was the year of the stiletto heels. So after dinner, Brando said, shall we take a walk? So we walked out there and soon enough my stiletto heel just sank in the lawn. So he said, uh, here, let me take it out for you. And very romantically, I mean, he lifted my ankle and was taking out the shoe from the garden when there was a eerie howl from the bottom of the garden. It was a jackal. And he said, is that a coyote? I said, no, it's a jackal. And then I tried a ploy. I was not sure it would work. But I said, you know, would you like me to stop the jackal howling? He said, yes. So I took off my shoes with the stiletto heels, put them toe to toe and said, my grandmother said that if you do this, the jackal will stop howling and that obliging jackal finished in about six seconds flat. <laughs> I'm sure there's a jackal's howl cycle, it just stopped in six seconds, but he said, voodoo, magic. And at that romantic moment, Ismail Merchant says, come in children, coffee is served. And that was the end of it? That was the end of it. I said to Ismail, you idiot. Actually, I said Uluka Patta, which is a very strong, <laughs> vulgar, Hindi abuse word. And uh, I said, I'll but never forget. fitting for the occasion. I suppose. <laughs> now, alongside all the amazing things you did on television, radio, you also were a columnist in newspapers. Your column, Film Notebook, ran in the Statesman for 35 years. I'm afraid so. And it began when you barged into the editor's office one day and said, can I write for the paper? Yes, um, I was uh, very brash. I went past the startled Chaprasi and it was Brit uh, still British days, you know, just after British days. It was in 1948. And I barged into Mr. Cooley Cowley's room and said, I'm Miss Roy and I just read your music review and it was atrocious. Why don't you let me write your music reviews? I used to be in charge of European music at All India Radio. He was a man with a tremendous sense of humor and he said, I agree that our review was very bad. But um, I'm afraid it, it was written by our sports reporter because our music critic was ill and the music critic will be back. So what else can you write? I said, anything, anything. So he said, all right, write something and bring it tomorrow. And I did. It was a short story called Hot Water about an elephant in Assam which um, fled after the car it had attacked. The, water from the radiator spurted in his face and he ran away. But uh, Cowley said, well, you said you were in All India Radio. Why don't you write radio reviews for us? And that's how it started, Listening Post. It was a column that attracted both praise and anger. I gather Khrushwan Singh once laid into you without even reading what you'd written. That's, he thought I had criticized him, but by then I had changed. I had gone to London for a year and somebody else was doing the reviews. And Khrushwan naturally thought I was still writing them. And he thought I'd panned... Uh, one of his uh, productions. He was then announcer producer in All India Radio, though he can always make a joke against himself. He said, I neither announce nor produce. But there was this feature and somebody else had panned it. So he was so angry, he didn't even ask me if I'd written it. And he didn't speak to me for a few years. But he started speaking again and we are very good friends. In 1946, you met the man you went on to marry, Iqbal Malik. What attracted you to each other? Well, we were both in radio. And we had the same taste. He was a student of philosophy and I of literature. And he was in charge of English talks and then went to drama. And I was in charge of English talks after him and then to Western music. It was one of those office romances, but we both liked the same sort of books and we were both in broadcasting in those heady days. And yet those heady days were just a year before partition, he was That's Muslim, right. you were Hindu. Was there a lot of resistance to what was by then an unorthodox marriage? Well, it is very strange, but the resistance came more from the department. Because Mr. Not Bok the families? The families were very, very uh, sort of 
diffident to begin with. His father was extremely generous. I went to Lahore to meet the family and he said, um, I don't care whether you have a Hindu marriage or a Muslim marriage as long as you have one religion. And I said, that would be dishonest to change your religion. Uh, we'd rather have a civil marriage. He ultimately agreed to that. And my mother was very upset. But my father, who was a great sport in many, more than one sense of the word, he came for the wedding. Mother didn't. And he behaved very handsomely. And then Iqbal won over my mother, because on our first visit to Calcutta, she cooked chingri machar malai curry, which is a prawn curry cooked with coconut in Bengal. And after he had that dinner, he walked down the street and bought one of those malas, jasmine malas, put it around her neck. And she was absolutely floored. After that, she thought he was her nicest son-in-law. You lived together for almost 20 years and yes. then separated. Yes. What was it that broke the marriage up? The fact that you were both working or did you just drift apart? I think it was professional more than anything else. You know, he was a civil servant. And at the back of the mind of anyone from any minority community, is that somebody is trying to get him. Things happened in office which had nothing to do with his religion, I'm sure. But he thought it had something to do with my column because everybody thought he gave me inside information when I was writing on radio and television. And he once said to these people, have you ever met my wife? Because nobody would dare foist any opinions on her. That was one thing. And the other was he was always underplaying himself because he, as a civil servant, he hardly met the press or made any public appearances. Whereas I was always in the news and my photo was in the papers. And very funny situations would arise. Somebody would say to him at a party, oh, we all know what Amita does. And what do you do, Mr. Malik? And he'd say, oh, nothing, nothing. He was then officiating as DG Doodarshan. But this sort of thing, I suppose, hurts and mounts up. And I think it was more being in the same profession but on either side of the fence. Probably that's it. The amazing thing is though you separated, you remained very close to each very other. Very close friends, yes. Do you miss him? Of course. I sometimes feel he's rung the doorbell. We remained very good friends, always ringing each other up about programs and about other things and about books. And when eventually you walk through the pearly gates, as one day we must all, and the good Lord says to you, Amit Amaleka, count for yourself, what will your reply be? I'll say, please forgive me my trespasses, but I think I did my best and tried to live by certain principles. That's a verdict we can all agree with. Mrs. Malik, for a wonderful interview. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very Malik. much, Karan.